So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the public part of the Proceedings of the Citizens' Assembly. Um, today, we are looking at social norms and stereotypes, and we're going to start off the afternoon with a very short video that takes us through um, how stereotypes are formed, and I think you'll find it very interesting. So, if Darren will press the right button, we'll be able to see the video. This afternoon, we're going to draw people doing different jobs. And the first job we're going to draw is a firefighter. Okay. Have a think in your head what a firefighter looks like. Oh, What's your firefighter called? Mine's called Firefighter Gary. Firefighter Stan. <laughs> firefighter Simon. He's big and strong. He's got a big helmet on. That's brilliant, isn't it? Next, we're going to draw a surgeon. Have you thought of a name for your surgeon? Jim. Jim Bob. He's a brain surgeon. I think he would wear a stethoscope. He gives you medicine. That's his ambulance. OK, next, we're going to draw a fighter pilot. Yes. This is his jet plane. He rescues people. He likes to do stunts in the air and stuff. OK, now, who would like to meet these people for real? Yeah. My name's Tamsin and I'm a surgeon in the NHS. My name's Lauren and I'm a pilot in the Royal Air Force. My name's Lucy, I'm a firefighter in the London Fire Brigade. So who wants to know how to do an operation? Who's <laughs> putting on? I'm Everyone trying my stethoscope. Oh, we'll put this in here. What does it look like? There you go. Now you're a proper fighter pilot. So into your ears. Can you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. It's really Mine's good. Much better, yeah, yeah, it's much better than my kids' Mine's one. <laughs> I can tell you, you, you liked that, and it's a very good way of making the point in a very little uh, space of time. Um, now we're going to um, hear from three people who um, were working in different careers, and we will hear how their gender has affected their career choices. First, we're going to hear from Lisa O'Brien, who's a quantity surveyor. So you might say that Lisa is working in what's traditionally regarded as a man's world. And I'm sure many of you will recognize her from her role on Room to Improve and trying to keep Dermot Bannon in order. <laughs> then we're going to hear from Oliver Allen, who is an emergency department nurse. So a man working in what's often um, considered to be a traditionally uh, feminized profession. And then we'll hear from Deirdre O'Neill, who um, is both a teacher and a researcher and is a close observer of early gender stereotyping. And when we've heard from the three of them, we will show you another little video, which is um, on girls and women in sport, and it's called, If She Can't See It, She Can't Be It. Um, but I think you'll find it very interesting now to hear from our three speakers about their take on our question about gender stereotyping. So Lisa, can we ask you to come up first, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure and privilege to be here today. I've been invited to speak about what motivated my career choice, if there are any social factor influences, and also to comment my experience as a woman in a very male-dominated construction industry. Um, to be perfectly honest, when I was 18, I had absolutely no idea what a quantity surveyor was, none whatsoever. It was not a conscious choice for me to become a quantity surveyor. As a child, I was extremely active and outdoors and very much sporty. My father would say, she's out running the roads. Couldn't get me in off the streets, basically. A career back then really wasn't spoken about where I came from. You got a job. You got a job after school or after college. But I knew that I wanted a job where I was independent, I had freedom, I was out and about, and I wasn't tied to a desk. I also had a dog, and his name was Kaiser. He was a bearded terrier. And you could probably say Kaiser was my social influence. He was literally joined to my hip. So I had a vision and a dream for myself and Kaiser to be driving around a Jeep, and I needed a Jeep to pull the horse box for the horse that I was going to buy 
from the money from my job. So with that in mind, that's how I actually filled out my CAO form. I eliminated all the courses that would not get myself and Kaiser into that sheet, which landed me in, the, in a course in construction technology in Bolton Street, where I was the only female of 45 male students. And I had just come from an all girls common school. So it was an absolute culture shock, to be honest with you. I thrived in college, it was really the time of my life. And I developed a huge passion for construction and it was that passion that really fueled my career choice from that point on. I'm a true believer of where your focus goes, energy flows. And I focused on learning my craft, developing my expertise, and I really immersed myself in the industry and I invested in myself with time and money. I never focused on actually being a woman in a male-dominated role. I felt I belonged there. And if someone did have a moment of judgment where I was a woman on a building site, I soon demolished that with my work ethic and my knowledge. It actually came to the point where the lads in sight would bypass the foreman to come to me because, in their words, this one gets it done. I don't let my gender prevent my successes, nor do I feel has it been associated to my failures, and there has been many of them on my journey. I feel attitude is everything. I was naturally solution oriented, goal focused, and I was very driven. And it was those personality traits that suited the construction industry. It's an industry that's fast paced, with tight budgets, and it's deadline driven. I continue to have that attitude, and I don't limit myself regardless of my gender or the industry. If I could give a takeaway today, and it's not a breakfast roll, ladies and gentlemen, is that as women, we cannot control people's perceptions of us or the expectations of a female career, what it is or what it isn't. We can only control the perception we have of ourselves and how we show up. And I just want to leave you with a quote. Um, it's from Napoleon Hill. He's the author of Think and Grow Rich, and I have it on my office wall. I've slightly altered it. And what he says is, Whatever the mind of man or woman can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was very inspiring. Next, we are going to hear from Oliver. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not used to this type of forum, so just please bear with me. Um, it's a great privilege to be here today to, to speak to you all and address you all. And thank you for the organizers for inviting me here today. If I could title this presentation, I would probably call it Men Can Care Too. Um, I suppose this is an important year for nursing um, across the world, as the World Health Organization has dedicated the year to the year of the nurse and the year of the midwife. And that is because a lady called Florence Nightingale, as some of you might, 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 might know and have heard of, um, was born 200 years ago um, this, this, this May. Um, Florence Nightingale herself was a feminist and had many quotes and things to say. One of the things she did say, though, was that nursing comes naturally to women. Um, I suppose this, this, um, this I suppose, quote of hers has really had, in my view, maybe a long-term unintended consequence on the societal view of uh, nursing being a uh, mainly female profession. We only have to do a Google search of, of a nurse or an uh, image of a nurse, and you will see it is mostly women who will be portrayed in the images. Also, from a practical point of view, when I'm at work, you uh, patients would regularly, regularly um, thank me and say, thank you, doctor, and that's because I'm a man. The, the, doc, the doctor might have been female and might have been with the patient for a long time and their family, and they would say, thank you, nurse. So we have that stereotypical view there. Uh, I suppose I was attracted to nursing because I always had an interest in caring for people, and I wanted to care for the person and not the illness, where I think nursing differs to other healthcare professions. My college years uh, were fantastic. I remember going into college on my first day, 250 people in the room, and about 15 of those were men. And I remember looking around the room to see where the other men were and felt reassured by that, because I suppose it was a little bit um, unsettling. Um, my experience as a man in nursing, I suppose, is that I don't refer to myself as being a male nurse. I am a nurse. 
Um, I haven't experienced any sexism or prejudice um, in my nursing career, which is a uh, 10 year span. I suppose from time to time, um, I might be called upon by my colleagues to help out with physical tasks. If something needs to be moved, a trolley or something heavy, they will come and ask me to do that. And, and other examples might be technical things with IT or, or equipment failures. Friendships is an interesting one in nursing. can be a bit difficult to, I suppose, um, to, to form outside of uh, the working environment. Um, regularly, you know, some of the girls at work might go away on a weekend away, but where the wife fit into that? That was a little bit uncomfortable for me as a man. I don't always get that invite, um, but it's just, I suppose it would be a bit awkward. How would their husbands feel if, if they knew there was a man going away with the, with the girls for a weekend away? So I suppose that's the flip side of it. In relation to men in nursing in Ireland, I suppose we're less than 8% of the overall nursing workforce, uh, which is 67,000 uh, nurses and midwives across the country. Men generally, uh, I suppose, are, are viewed in nursing from my female colleagues as seeing going into leadership positions, um, into management roles very quickly, and they would also, would, would be, I suppose, um, aligned to suppose, some of the specialist areas, for example, intensive care nursing, emergency department nursing, um, and, and various other specialties. Psychiatric nursing is another popular area for uh, male nurses um, to, to go into as well, um, which I'm sure has reasons for that too. Um, so I suppose the benefits of working, I suppose, alongside women, I suppose uh, an obvious one to me is that I know if, I suppose women, I suppose, in my view, have a heightened sense of emotion and I suppose if they'd be quick to pick up on things and I know if I was, I suppose, upset by something in work or something was bothering me, they'd be quick to pick up on it and I know I would get that support from them. Um, I suppose going forward into the future, finally, just to comment on, we have a worldwide um, shortage of nurses and I suppose what, what we need to try and do is, is normalize the, the role that men can play in nursing. And I suppose that might help with the recruitment issues um, and continue to publicize nursing as a, as a career choice for men. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Oliver. Again, very inspiring to hear about your journey and your career. And now Deirdre is going to talk to us about from her perspective. Thank you, Catherine, and I'm delighted to be here today. When I was about six, I said to my mother, I want to be a fireman. I must have seen something on TV to inspire me. She laughed at me and said, you can't be a fireman. You can be a firefighter. That wasn't good, good enough for me at the time. So I said to myself, I'll prove her wrong. As you can see, gender association was never really an obstacle for me, and I'm lucky to be able to say that this trend follow me to where, followed me to where I am today. I soon forgot about my passion for fighting fires and found my true love for teaching. I'd like to say that I would have been a teacher no matter what my parents did or what they told me, but now I realize that my mother's traits as a teacher herself and my father's respect for the profession definitely led me to where I am today. However, there are many other influencers along the way that motivated my career choice. In secondary school, choosing physics as a leaving cert subject proved to be a challenge. I had a very inspiring, passionate physics teacher, but there were only two people in my class interested in taking the subject, and it was threatened to be axed. To put this into context, in Ireland, only 14% of the student cohort take physics to leaving cert, and 4% are girls. This, there's a similar issue for boys in this subject, such as home economics, where only 3% of boys take home economics. Anyways, myself and the second girl who chose physics approached the principal and dramatically proposed an ultimatum. Run physics or we'll move school. She didn't call our bluff, thankfully, but recognized that this really mattered to us. And her care for our passion made it possible to continue to study physics. She asked us to recruit two more students to do the subject, and then she would run it. And so we did. Three years later, physics was no longer a leaving cert subject in my school. Today, 22% of Irish secondary schools do not offer physics as a leaving cert subject. I went on to complete a four-year degree in science education in DCU and qualified to be a maths and physics teacher. Now I was on my own. Moving to Bahrain was an adventure for me, but a huge culture shock. I was teaching students from primary level all the way up to final year of secondary school in gender segregated classes. Girls sat together on the right side of the classroom, boys on the left. However, the influence of culture on these students was not what you would expect. All students were extremely academically driven. 
Their focus was on getting the top of their class and the girls were just as competitive as the boys, which contradicts the typical stereotype of boys being more competitive and girls just not interested in the physical sciences. Role models were a huge influence for these students and in most cases they saw their teachers as their role models. People of different nationalities and genders using their profession to travel and learn new experiences. I started to think about moving home and I sent out some feelers about doing a PhD. When I was approached by my past lecturer, Eilish McLaughlin, to engage in a gender imbalance project, we decided it would be a great stepping stone to complete a PhD. We started to look at gender imbalance um, of subjects at secondary school and how to increase the number of girls taking STEM subjects. I'll focus on the work we did with the whole school, unconscious bias and gender stereotyping, awareness for the context of today. When I talk about unconscious bias, I'm referring to the snap decisions and dis judgments your brain makes unknown to yourself. It really is something you have to experience to understand its effect. And so I ask you today to close your eyes and visualize the first thing that comes into your mind when I, say, when I ask you to think about a person with a disability. If they're in a wheelchair, open your eyes. If your eyes are still closed, I want you to visualize a person with Down syndrome. If it's a child, open your eyes. If your eyes are still closed, I want you to visualize a person with autism. If they are male, open your eyes. And finally, if your eyes are still closed, I want you to visualize a person with mental health issues. If they are white, open your eyes. These are all typical stereotypes that you have in your mind and they're formed by patterns of your economic background, what you see online socially. We worked with 28 schools over nine counties for three years and what did we learn? There is no one size fits all to tackle the inequities around subject uptake. Gender imbalance and stereotype threat. Each school that we engage with had their own unique plan to bring the four issues that may be a result of harmful unconscious bias. Also, awareness of unconscious bias and the effects it has on students' decisions to choose particular subjects or engage in extracurricular activities must involve the whole school, school leaders, teachers, students, and parents. What's what good for girls is good for all. We must remember that the word gender does not just relate to females, which can sometimes be the first thing that jumps to mind when the topic is mentioned. If you want to impact on school culture, you must promote equality in all activities in the school. Finally, we learned from our schools that teachers and parents need support in promoting different careers in all subjects. We are in an era where job opportunities are rapidly expanding and it's likely that our students will have several jobs in their lifetime. Keeping up to date with these difficulties difficult for, is difficult for teachers and parents, especially when they're in one profession for many years. We also need our teachers to reflect the variety of students present in our Irish classrooms today. So promoting teaching as a profession of prestige and importance is essential to our economy and opening up subject choice to all students, unlike what happened to physics in my school after I finished. Thank you very much. I love running, like, I'm very good at it. All my family calls me speedy. I'm black belt. I got a whack in the knee today, or a hurl. When you get in the boat, you just get this rush. Ronaldo. Paul Pogba. Usain Bolt. Jack McCaffrey. Rory McIlroy. Women's sports stars. <sighs> um. I don't really know any of the girls, so. Whenever people are recording things, they don't want to record girls for some reason. Oh, you have to come to this match, it's going to be great. And then the women's are just kind of like, oh, come if you can. The only thing that they pass to us, if the teacher makes a rule saying you have to pass to five girls before you can score. In my head, I would be like, you should have passed to me. Then, like, real life, I, I just don't say anything. And I'd really like to thank um, our speakers um, for sharing um, in a very engaging way 
their own pathways, their own experience, and of how the jobs that they are in and the career choices they made um, are and are not affected by their gender. And I think it's given us a lot of food for thought. So I'd like you to really give them a big round of applause and say thank you to them. And thank you very much for being here with us on a Saturday afternoon. Now, we've had um, the personal experiences and we've had two short videos. We're now going to um, invite to the podium Professor Sheila Green uh, from uh, Trinity College Dublin. And she's going to talk about gender norms and stereotypes and the psychology of all of this. So, Sheila, can we invite you to come to the podium, please? Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's um, a great pleasure for me to have been asked to talk to you today. And um, my topic is gender norms and stereotypes. I want to start off by talking about definitions, because we're using a lot of these words that sometimes aren't very clear. And even the definition of the difference between sex and gender is not always clear and is quite often debated. So when I s give you my definition, somebody else might say, hmm, it doesn't suit me, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. Sex is determined by biological characteristics associated with being male or female. Very rarely, about one in 2,000, maybe one in one and a half thousand children are born with ambiguous genitalia and there might be some difficulty in assigning them clearly to being boy or girl at birth. Transgender is a term that many of us have only become familiar with us recently. Uh, transgen a transgender individual might wish to change from being um, seen as male and masculine to female and feminine. Transsexual would involve actual change of secondary sexual characteristics in order to, uh, to acquire the appearance and function of the opposite sex. Gender, then, is a person's social and cultural identification as male or female, masculine or feminine. I've been asked to talk about norms and standards. They are the behaviors in this context that we expect from males and females, and they vary cross-culturally, and they vary historically, and you can see that just looking back in time in our own country. Sex role stereotypes, then, are beliefs held about male and female natures and capacities. <clears throat> stereotypes are important, as we've already seen. They have impact in a number of different ways. So, for example, if we hold the stereotype, boys don't cry, we might be likely to say, as a parent, don't cry to the little boy. But the little boy himself, thinking I am a boy, boys don't cry, I say I'm a, I'm a big boy, I mustn't cry. We see st stereotypes operating in terms of discrimination and bias. So if we hold the views that women are softer and more emotional, we might say, well, we can't hire a woman for that job, which inv involves a lot of tough uh, decisions and leadership of maybe a bunch of men. We see stereotypes operating to restrict options. So we hold a stereotype maybe that girls love pink and cute animals. So we find in the shops nothing but pink clothes covered with butterflies and unicorns available for our little girls. It's interesting and this is something you may be aware of, that a hundred years ago, pink was thought to be a very strong color and suitable for boys, and blue was thought to be a very delicate color, which was obviously suitable for boys. So this just shows how arbitrary some of our stereotypes might be. Then we find more seriously stereotypes operating to infringe people's human rights. So if we happen to have a view that women's role is to serve men, that may be uh, lead to um, a situation such as we find with basically domestic slavery and um, similar infringements of people's human rights, both male and female. 
So where do these differences that we see between men and women as we look around, where do they come from? Well, certainly they come from our biology. Uh, sometimes, say, a feminist perspective is seen to deny biology. Um, I don't think we can deny biology. When we look at newborn babies, we see differences in size, in activity levels, and in vulnerability, boys being much more vulnerable than girls to a lot of different conditions. This is why there are more boys born than girls to adjust for that physical vulnerability of a baby boys in gestation and around the time of birth. But these, these differences are actually quite small <coughs> and they are evident at a group level. So if we simply know what sex a, a baby is or a, a small child is, it's quite uninformative about their size or their strength the overlap being as large as it is. As they get older, we will see the emergence of other um, differences that probably have biological roots. Girls, for example, all over the world are found to develop language skills earlier. Boys have greater muscular strength. And as they enter puberty, some of these differences become more marked. And some of the differences are, of course, that we see at that time are biological. And then we have socialization. We, take, we seem to take quite small biological differences and we build on them. The overlap, as I say, remains considerable in childhood and, and later. And for example, we will get girls who are stronger than boys and boys who are more verbally uh, competent than girls. These biological differences are universal, but what societies make of them will vary across cultures and across times. What we do know is that lack of opportunity can create some biological differences. For example, in this picture, we see a little girl kind of throwing like a girl, that expression. On the other side, we see an Olympic shot putter. I think it's a shot, but I'm not very good on these things who obviously is very capable biologically at this point. And giving opportunity to boys or girls to do things can actually change their brains and their muscular, muscularity and their bodily capacity. So socialization and expectations can change biology. And here's where stereotypes come in. At this point, I want to show you a little video which I think is quite informative. <clears throat> Look at this. Look at this. Do you like a dolly? Shall we go for a dolly? There's a good girl. You're a good little girl, aren't you, Sophie? Look, what does this say? Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. Yeah. <gasps> Ooh. Look at this, Sophie. She liked that pink, pink dolly the best. If I were to tell you actually that Sophie is Edward, ah, does well, that change anything? I maybe thought, oh, well, this is a little girl, so I have to give her little girl things. So hello. So hello. 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 Come on. What's this one? Oh, what's that one do? Is that a robot? What about this? Oh, you like that one. What does this one do? Oliver, Oliver. You've gone for, you could say, boy toys for possibly, this boy. Possibly, possibly in my subconscious, but t for me, I was just going for what was around me, but I then see. perhaps my subconscious was automatically playing a trick on me. That I was if I tell you that he is actually a girl. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. 
I suppose it's because of the stereotype. And then that changed your behaviour yes, towards it the did. child. It did. And your behaviour was lie. quite yeah, directive. Did. One, two, three. Do you want to see my robot? She's picked up the robot, the car, the puzzle game. And I think she's been much more physical in handling the child than the other adults have been with girls. That really astounded me because I thought that I was somebody that had a really open mind. The surprise. Um, so I automatically went for the, the pink, pink fluffy toy because I said it was a girl, so, so I was sort of stereotyping. I've always thought I was rather more open-minded that, than that, and I would think, you know, ch these are children's toys, whatever the gender. It will make me think uh, the next time I'm with a child, so my, my niece or my nephew, to make sure that I am actually being sort of fair <laughs> and equal with all of them, uh, and just giving each child an opportunity to just be whoever they are. So, as you see, I think, quite strongly in that study, which, uh, as I say, has been often replicated, I actually replicated it several times with my students here in Dublin, um, stereotypes can of often operate unconsciously. Um, typically, if you ask um, parents if they would treat their boys and girls any differently, they often say, oh, no, no, but in actuality, they find themselves doing so. Some very famous uh, researchers in this area, Maccabee and Jacqueline, who looked at a whole range of stereotypes about um, boys and girls' behavior, including things like girls talk more, etc., and found most of them not to be substantiated. They said that most gender role stereotypes are cultural myths. But they persist, and that's the interesting question. Why do they persist? In fact, we use stereotypes all the time, not just in relation to gender. It's one of the ways we organize the world around us. They simplify our complex world. And they may also serve agendas, say the agendas of those who have power and don't want to relinquish it, or those who feel threatened in some way by another group, or those who want to bolster their own feelings, so we get pernicious stereotypes like um, white people are more intelligent, things that we find very shocking but that are, we need to look at why do people think this way? Why does this way of thinking um, persist? Why are stereotypes perpetuated? Do they serve some functions? I want to look at gender norms and stereotyping in the family. Families don't exist in isolation. Everybody in the family is being influenced by their external context and by their own histories. So as parents, if we are parents, we bring our history to bear. But the family does matter a lot. It's, it is, has an early and very direct impact on the child's behavior and beliefs. It's very important and it starts very early. And in fact, these days, um, it starts earlier than ever because these days, uh, many, fam many parents will choose to find out the sex of their children and they can do so by ultrasound at about 20 weeks. They can do so even earlier if they want through using uh, DNA pregnancy tests, which give them that information. And now we have the new phenomenon, which seems to be, have entered Ireland from the USA, of gender reveal parties, where very, very early on in pregnancy, uh, everybody is celebrating the, the fact that the, 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 this baby to come is either a boy or a girl. This balloon, when popped, will have blue confetti or pink confetti already for the party. Parents may participate in sexual stereotyping either consciously or unconsciously. For some parents, it's important that their boys behave like boys and their girls behave like boys, girls, but other as I said, that maybe an unconscious process is going on that they'd be quite shocked by when they, or are shocked by if they, if they are revealed. You find it in the choice of decor, the boy's bedroom versus the, the girl's bedroom, and clothing and toys, those choices that parents make. And then in the behaviors directed towards the child, whether they are reinforced or discouraged from certain patterns of behavior versus others, we find that parents encourage play with same-sex toys 
and they sit closer to girls and talk more with them. There's quite a lot of evidence in different research studies of parents behaving differently, even though they think they don't. And we do find a relationship between high levels of stereotyped thinking in parents and more stereotyped behavior in their children. Now, as I've said, the outside will get inside into the family, so the books the kids read, the TV that they watch, all of these things will have an influence from early days. And children, of course, will adopt these stereotypes themselves. They're not passive in this process. They actively get involved in stereotyping the others and in typing themselves at this uh, idea, I am a girl, therefore I do girl things. And little kids are very strong on those sorts of rules. By age two, children be typically become aware of being a boy or a girl and can label themselves. And by three, they've started to develop stereotyped ideas about boys and girls. So even in preschool, you'll find them um, saying, I'm not wearing that pink shirt or I'm not going to play with dolls and the girls sort of uh, will comment on each other's behavior, whether it's appropriate, or the boys don't wear bobbles in their hair. All of this happens in preschool and has been widely observed. Gender role conformity becomes very strong from about the age of three to nine, and I know you've heard from the young scientists um, earlier, and that was very marked in their study, which was on, um, I think, around the kids around the age seven to nine. It is actually more marked in boys. So tomboy, as we've heard already, is a more acceptable um, thing to be called as a girl than the, uh, the opposite for boys, and which has a less uh, positive connotation. So boys are called often sissy, and we have discovered in studies done here in Ireland that they use the term gay as a term of abuse, really, um, against little boys who they think are unduly feminine. So this is a very unfortunate um, pattern of behavior that we see uh, uh, from very early on. And this self-policing and policing by peers starts in the preschool years. We don't have to wait until later to see evidence of this. What does happen a little bit later on, around about uh, eight, nine, is that children get a bit more flexible about these rules. And so we have a period of a few years where they're much more um, tolerant of, of uh, infringement of the rules. But this tends to become intensified again when they get to teenage years and puberty kicks in. And it matters very much as to you being a, a seen as a feminine or masculine um, in your behavior. In growing up in Ireland, which I was involved in for a number of years, we asked nine-year-olds about the opposite sex. And we found these, uh, these are some of the comments the kids made. So nine-year-old boys, the girls dress different and play different and they think different. And another one, the girls like to do makeup and their nails and they're like puppies and everything cute and they like pink things. And the interviewer says, what about boys? Boys like the outdoors more. They like to stand in a field. I have this lovely little sort of image of it. <laughs> um, I think clearly a boy from, from the country. Girls and girls say, oh, they boys are much more immature than girls, I think. They just, when you try to be serious with them, they just go and mess with their friends or something. <laughs> Another girl, boys are really different. They play different sports, wear different clothes, do different stuff. They spend way too much time watching TV and on the computer, and they don't read books unless they are nerds. So there you go. <laughs> so how am I one can't counteract these stereotypes. There's multiple possibilities for doing so. Once one um, agrees that this is something that is important to do. So through le legislation and regulation, we might ha have um, in terms of the introduction of referenda perhaps, um, in terms of trade um, bodies like the, um, the Irish Advertising, Standing, Advertising Standards Authority for Ireland, they talk about ads should, should avoid stereotyping. Sex discrimination is one of the nine grounds for discrimination, which can be used in terms of employment disputes, etc. We might introduce positive discrimination and quotas. These are all policy and, 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 and legislative choices that are open to us. In education, which is important, 
um, we find that in t teachers at preschool and uh, at higher levels um, tend, even against their own um, principles, perpetuate some of this by saying, boys line up over there, girls line up over there. Um, boys, will you uh, move the chairs? Girls, will you give out the pencils? Seems innocuous. But these are choices that are made very often unconsciously and can be changed if one wishes to change them, and certainly the INTO has had discussions along this line, these lines. In terms of materials, it's possible to use counter-stereotype books and materials and have debates and discussions on this topic. Another way to look at it is from the point of view of um, individuals the, who might band together in campaigns to try and change things, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment of, of campaigns that we have, that I'm aware of in other countries. And then as individuals, we can say no. We can say no to buying only blue clothes for our boys and pink clothes for our girls. We can challenge retailers and say to them, what are you doing here? We want more choice. We can change our own interactions with children whether we be grandparents or parents or aunties or uncles or teachers or whatever. Looking at what some other countries have done in schools, it's possible to add gender role awareness training to teacher training and to school curricula. For example, in Sweden, the national preschool curriculum requires teachers to counteract traditional gender patterns and gender roles, our own curricula here, um, uh, the Ashtar and uh, other curricula that are used to, um, typically don't do this. In the UK, the NUT, National Uni Union of Teachers, conducted a review in 2013 called Stereotypes Stop You Doing Stuff, and they encouraged their members to challenge stereotyping. Some of the campaigns I mentioned briefly earlier in the UK, we, there was a camp, there are campaigns called Let Toys Be Toys, um, let clothes be clothes. And these are typically parent-based organizations who get together to, to challenge retailers, not just to, to have aisles which are obviously boy toys and aisles which are girl toys, but to mix them together. Same with clothes. And for example, John Lewis brought out a range of um, unisex clothing for boys and girls um, as a result of the campaign, mainly let clothes be clothes. There's another advocacy, a group called Pink Stinks. You can imagine what they are about. Um, again, challenging retailers and others not to identify girls always with pink and fluffy things. Um, what is called sometimes the pinkification of girlhood. Um, in Germany, um, a, a Pink Stinks is, is very active, as in the UK, and in Australia there's a similar organisation called Because Why. And many of these organisations are readily accessible on, uh, on the web. Another level completely would be through um, human rights and international treaties, and there's a lot of discussion now of stereotypes in those areas. Uh, one very important treaty which Ireland has ratified, which is um, uh, the Convention, I have to, often have to read all of this because um, it, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, um, <coughs> which actually came out in 1979. Um, it talks about um, the uh, requiring state parties who ratify this convention to take all appropriate measures to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women in an effort to eliminate practices that are based on the idea of the inferiority or the superiority of either of the sexes or on stereotype roles for men and women. A UN report called Gender Stereotyping as Human Rights Violation, produced by um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, talks about wrongful stereotyping and harmful stereotyping. And it is interesting looking at this issue of um, stereotyping as something very serious, um, which can have very marked effects on the behavior and well-being of men and women across the globe. <coughs> I think 
conclusion, then, or some conclusions, the way in which we think about sex and gender is deeply embedded in our culture and we learn about it from babyhood. It operates in subtle and not so subtle ways. The goal in challenging stereotypes is not to make the sexes the same. Males and females with highly sex stereotype behavior are found to have lower levels of well-being. And this points us in, in, in terms of the dangers of a very um, uh, marked uh, adherence to sex role stereotypes because it's associated very often with rigidity and it can be associated in extreme forms with what we might call toxic masculinity. Masculinity which is associated with aggression, lack of um, uh, sensitivity to the feelings of oneself and the feelings of others, um, being strong no matter what. This is associated with uh, higher levels of um, alcoholism and other mental health problems. Likewise in women, very, being too strongly sexual stereotyped in terms of being very passive, non-assertive, um, is also associated with things like higher, lower levels of self-esteem and higher levels of depression. Sadly, we found in growing up in Ireland that at, that at 20, far more young women than men were suffering from elevated levels of depression. And we know that in teenage years, previously very assertive and happy young women often start um, showing lower levels of self-esteem and confidence as they seem to become more sex role stereotyped in their behavior. So stereotypes manifest in multiple ways and need to be tackled then through multiple forms of intervention, both formal and informal, by institutions and by individuals. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Sheila. That was fascinating. And again, you've given us a lot of food for thought. So now that brings um, to an end the public part of our session for today. So we're going to finish with the live streaming here. I want to thank Sheila very much for giving us her time and her expertise. Obviously, uh, you have uh, done a great amount of study over a long time period and you've seen how things evolve and we are the beneficiaries of all that knowledge. So very warm heart and thanks to you for, for being with us this afternoon. Um, we're going to take a break now and I'm going to ask you to be back for uh, 10 past three. Is that right, uh, Mary Claire? But two things before you actually stand up. Um, first of all, I want just so that you're very aware of this, that all of the presentations, including the videos and everything, they're all going to be available on the web online, so you can revisit them afterwards if you want to. But they'll all be emailed to you as well, the slides and the presentations, so you'll have them uh, because we will come back to a lot of these topics and you may be saying in April, oh, I, that was very interesting, somebody said at the beginning what was it, so you'll have all the information and if you can't find it, just ask us and we'll be happy to provide it. And secondly, if there is anybody who hasn't I handed up yet their survey to Jane, could you please just um, put your hand up now and she'll come and collect them. So the, the start of the weekend surveys, if there's still anybody, I think she has uh, gathered a good number, but it may be that one or the other person still has theirs. So if you could just pass that on, Jane would be delighted to um, begin to analyze um, your thoughts at the beginning of the weekend. So um, we will now take a break. Um, and if you could all be back at 10 past three, um, we're going to very quickly take a look and see do you have any questions for Professor Green like we did before and then we'll go into a round table um, with some questions that we will uh, want to put to you and then at 25 past four we'll go back into public session just to report on um, what's been discussed at the round tables. So hopefully that's clear to everybody. So break now and then back at 10 past three please.